Welcome to the Standing in the Gap Wibbles and Wobbles of Anxiety online resource. Um, my name's Sam, I'm the Clinical Director for Standing in the Gap. Um, my background is I'm a nurse and a health visitor, I've worked with families for over 15 years um, and I have a Master's in Child and Adolescent Mental Health. So Standing in the Gap is a what we class as an early intervention mental health charity. We work with preschool and primary age children, um, helping them manage the big emotions of fear, anxiety, anger and grief. We do that by offering a range of facilitated workshops. Um, please do look at our website for more details on where and when they are, um, and also some digital resources like this. The aim of this talk is we're very aware that anxiety has gone up significantly. We know that there's been a 48% increase in anxiety since 2004. Um, our courses are extremely popular, but we're also aware that for some families coming to a group environment to talk about anxiety is actually too much or you might not live in the geographical area. So this course, the aim is that we want to help you and your child understand what anxiety is, um, what does it feel like, how does it work, um, what's the physiology and the psychology behind it. Um, we look at what's a normal, why does a normal feeling become very overwhelming. Um, we look at some very basic techniques that can help. Um, we use nice guidelines, we use evidence-based research. Um, we look at, a, we've got a three-step stage for managing anxiety, which we can work you through and how to do it. We've also got a section in the, in the talk about, for parents, on what does help and what doesn't help. You know, all of us want to help our kids, but so often we're not sure what to do. So we're quite hopefully useful in able to give you some guidelines. It's not a guilt session, so don't worry. Um, it does enable you to think, OK, I know what I'm doing is helping. Um, and we also have a section towards the end of the talk about what to do if it doesn't win. When do I need more help and who do I go and talk to? So hopefully you'll find this a really useful um, session and something you can watch with your child. Um, we do have an anxiety pack that we sell via our website. Um, we've got in it a workbook. All the information from the talk is in the workbook. It is quite useful. Um, you can personalise it and work through with your child which bits work for them, what's happening, where you're at, all the different techniques. We have the stars in it. Um, we also have some faces charts, um, bits and pieces, and a worry book is included in the pack. So you can get these off the website. They are really worthwhile. Um, managing anxiety is not a necessarily a quick process, but once you've got the techniques, it's something you can keep coming back to. So settle in and we hope you enjoy the talk. Um, thank you very much. As I said, if you want to contact us, you can contact us via the website. Um, we'd love to hear how it works for you. Thank you. Fantastic. So I'd like you to meet our elves. We have two elves that help us in our mental elf. Um, we have our purple one, who's our mental elf, and he helps us look at our feelings and our emotions and what causes them. And we also use him a lot to help us on how do we cope with different things. So in our pack, you'll see that we've got mental elf's wibbly wobbly ladder, and we've got our worry book, and we've got all sorts of different things that mental elf helps us do. So he's our mental elf, and he's purple because I like purple. And our physical elf is the green one here, and he helps us understand our bodies because we are made up very complicatedly and our hormones and our bodies and our physiological reactions impact on how our feelings are. So we use him to help us look at the physiology behind it, but also look at some practical and physical ways that we can use to manage different emotions. So, what is anxiety? Okay, so what you first need to know is that anxiety is a very normal feeling. And the reason it's a very normal feeling is that we were designed to get anxious so we don't get eaten by bears. Okay, so the aim is that your brain senses a threat and what it does is it sends an, a, a, a hormone called adrenaline to your heart and to your legs. And what that does is it makes your heart beat very fast and it makes your legs get ready to run. Now that works very well if you come across a bear because you go... <gasps> And then your heart works really fast and your legs work really fast and you run away from bears. Now, as far as I can tell, there aren't many bears in Banbury or Bloxham. We're quite particular. Um, so we don't get those. So what's a normal physiological reaction and is designed to keep us safe sometimes gets a little bit skewed. And we're going to come on and look at that. But actually feeling anxious is okay. 
We are designed to feel that way. Anybody who's doing something new for the first time is going to feel a little bit fluttery, is going to feel a little bit scared. If you may have a new teacher for the first time, everybody's going to feel a little bit wobbly. If you go to a new school, some of that is quite normal. It's about when it stops you doing things that we're looking at some stuff now. Okay, so what we're going to look with our little physical elf here is what does anxiety feel like? Now, there's a lot of different feelings with anxiety, so it, it doesn't mean you have to tick all of them to have it, but it just shows the range of different feelings that we have. So, some people say that it makes their heart go very fast and their legs feel very strong. Some people say it makes their legs feel very jelly wobbly and not very nice. That they can feel tingling in their hands and feet. Because sometimes if you breathe very fast, you, go, you, you can actually get quite a lot of tingling. They do breathe very fast, which is your hyperventilation. And with that, you can feel a little bit dizzy, or a little bit difficult to breathe, or wanting to go to the toilet a lot, which is why around exam times, everybody needs the loo. Um, and can feel sick. So some of this is your adrenaline working on your body to make it work fast. If it doesn't need to work fast, you can end up feeling a bit sick, which isn't a very nice feeling. So the other thing sometimes people say is it feels like a really tight band across their chest. Uh, they can feel a bit headachey. Some people can get very hot and feel very sweaty. And this is all of our bodies, normal physiological things to get you ready to run away from bears, but there aren't any bears. So that's why we feel that all these feelings, but it feels a bit overwhelming at times. So you can have a dry mouth, end up a little bit shaky, a little bit wobbly. Um, sometimes people can feel like they're choking um, and can cough quite a bit. Um, or palpitations when your heartbeat feels a little bit wonky. So there's a whole range of feelings that go with anxiety because our bodies are designed to respond. So they automatically go down this route to respond and then you get the feelings. And then what sometimes happens is because you then get those feelings, you then worry about those feelings and think, oh my goodness, my body's making me feel funny, I feel tingly, I feel jelly legs, I feel wobbly, I feel sick, something must be very wrong. So what happens then is emotionally we start to feel things as well. So we've got our little purple elf here now who's our mental elf, who's come to help us. And sometimes you can think that it, I'm losing control, I'm feeling really poorly, this is really horrible, um, I might even be going mad. Some people can feel really poorly and think, actually, I think I could die. I think I've got something really wrong with me because this bit hurts or that bit hurts or this bit's not working or this bit feels strange or oh my goodness. Um, or you can be thinking, I'm going to have a heart attack, I am actually going to throw up or I'm going to faint in front of everybody. And the worst bit to do when you have any strange, weird and wonderful symptoms is to Google them. Because you then end up with at least something terrible because all the symptoms fit with things. And then that doesn't help either because then you end up being more anxious and actually you really could have that there. Um, so it can become in what's called we call a vicious cycle where you have worries and concerns and we're going to be looking at those. So the other thing is that often happens when people are feeling really anxious is that everybody can see what you're feeling. So when you're going somewhere and feeling wobbly, you sometimes think that everybody else will be able to tell. They can't, because people can't look into your head and they can't know how you're feeling, but it feels like they can. Um, and it sometimes feels that things are going very, very fast or very, very slow. And that can feel quite hard if you're trying to do things. Sometimes it can be that people feel quite detached and they just um, move away from a situation and don't get involved if they're feeling wobbly. Or you can end up feeling that you want to run away or escape. Or I don't like it and I don't want to do it and I'm not going to go there. Um, or the other thing sometimes that we find that children tell us is they feel very edgy and very alert and very look a bit hypervigilant to everything that's going around. So they get a little bit jumpy and a little bit worried and a little bit anxious from there. So as you can see, there's quite a lot of thoughts and feelings that go with anxiety. Um, and what we find is that we have our thoughts and our feelings and what tends to happen is that leads to behaviour. So it's the behaviour that very often people come and talk to me about. So they say, my child doesn't want to go to this place, doesn't like this, wants to avoid it, I can't get them to go, I think that's a problem, can you make them better? Now because it's all linked with our thoughts, feelings and behaviour, unless we unpick some of the thoughts and the feelings, it's really hard to change the behaviour. So this bit, thoughts, feelings and behaviour, is the basis of what we call um, a technique called cognitive behaviour therapy. So it's something that we know is very, very effective with anxiety and helps us break things down. 
So it's a technique that we use the basis of with the things that we're looking at. So it's an evidence-based technique, it's part of the NICE guidelines, it's what's recommended for managing anxiety, and we know it works. So, what do we need? Right, so why does a normal feeling feel so horrible and so big and so overwhelming? And why does it affect some people and not other people? Right, well I need to tell you about my doorbell. We lived in a house, not that long ago, that when we moved in, we were very pleased, we had a, a Wi-Fi doorbell, it's all very posh, and you press the doorbell, and we, we could tell that something was at the door. Now, the door was not at the end of the hallway, it was on the side of the hallway, so you couldn't see. Now, I quite like having people come to the house, so the doorbell would ring, and you'd think, excellent, it could be a parcel, it could be somebody coming to visit, it could be something nice, it could be carol singers, it could be people asking for money, but on the whole, it was quite positive. So it was a really good experience. The doorbell went, we went to the door, something was there. After a little bit of time, it all went a little bit wonky. So, you get a doorbell and you'd go out and there'd be nobody there. You think, how is this working? So we then thought, hmm, one off, fair enough. And the doorbell would go and there'd be nobody there. And the doorbell went very early in the morning. And there was nobody there. It went, went, once went at two o'clock in the morning. By which point you think at least somebody must have died. <laughs> and then you do get a good shot of adrenaline and turn up and think, oh my goodness, nobody. So then we started to think, what on earth is going on with this? What is happening here? Because we were pretty sure it wasn't the kids in the neighbourhood because you could see from our lounge and know the doorbell would go without anybody being there. Very strange. We eventually worked out what it was, and it was the man down the road, his clicker for his car was on the same frequency as our doorbell. <laughs> so when he clicked his car, our doorbell rang, which was great unless he came in at two o'clock in the morning and he locked his car, which was very safe, and our doorbell rang. So what we had to do with our very clever, we thought, not so clever after a while, doorbell was change the frequency. So we put it on a different frequency so it didn't pick up alternative signals and then we went back to it only works when we needed it to work and anxiety is exactly that what happens is your brain sends wonky doorbell signals to your body so you get worried it rings the doorbell and your brain goes i've seen a threat i'm going to produce some adrenaline i'm going to get all these feelings my legs are ready to run oh okay and it you've got nowhere to run so you've got nowhere to get rid of all that excess adrenaline and the feelings going on so what we need to do is make sure that we can challenge and work out what is a wonky doorbell feeling? What is a proper thing I'm supposed to be worried about? Because we're designed as human beings, so some things we are going to need to respond. You know, that's why you get taught to look when you cross the road. That's why you shouldn't do certain things because, you know, it could be a problem. But you don't want to feel it all the time. Now, the other thing we talk about is negative thoughts. Now, everybody gets these, and I mean everybody. People on Instagram, your teachers, famous footballers, YouTube stars, your mum, the Queen, everybody. And what these are is these little these are little thoughts that go into your head that says, it's not gonna work, you can't do that, you'll fall on your face, it'll look ridiculous, you know. And generally what you do as a big as a person who doesn't have anxiety or a big person is you go, ah, I'm gonna weigh it up with other things. Have I fallen on my face recently? Hopefully not. You know, negative thoughts about being filmed are quite high. Um, you have lots of them. Um, but again, you go, well, you know, what's the worst that's going to happen? I'm unlikely to be electrocuted, hopefully. Um, you know, and you keep doing things. It doesn't stop you because you go, do you know what? That's just a negative thought. And I can, I can ignore that because it's just a thought. Just because it comes into my head doesn't mean it's real and doesn't mean it's big. So that's something we're going to be looking at. Now, one of the things people ask me quite a lot is, we get all the physiology, but why is it when my child has a meltdown, they have a meltdown over a little thing, not always a big thing, and then we've completely lost it, and how does that work? Now, this is when our stress bucket comes in. So everybody has a stress bucket. The size of your bucket will depend on how resilient you are. So that's a word we use quite a lot, is how much you can cope with things. It doesn't matter, but everybody's got a bucket. What you do have on your bucket is you have a tap. Now the things that fill up your bucket are different things. 
So sometimes it's big <coughs> things, moving house, changing schools, having a new teacher, getting a new pet, meeting a new person, doing all sorts of different things can fill up your bucket. But little things fill up your bucket. I can't find my shoes, I can't decide what to have for breakfast, I don't know, my hair's not right, this is not working, this is not helpful. I'm no parent sit and sob because their porridge is lumpy. Nothing to do with lumpy porridge, it was just, that was the bit that tipped them over the edge. Oh, yeah. Let's see. Um, and that's the bit that makes them feel very wobbly, which is fine. So everybody has a stress bucket and what tends to happen is it's often the little bits that tip us over the edge and make you think, I can't do this anymore. Which is often the one when you're trying to get out the door and you can't find the shoes or you've had the conversation 423 times or the seatbelt doesn't work or you can't find your car keys or all the bits that can then come together and go very wonky. So that's how it tends to work. So what it's worth noting is you've got a tap on the side. So there's certain things that can open your stress and relieve your stress levels. If you notice, it's not at the top and it's not at the bottom. There is a certain amount of stress that you're going to get in life, whatever we do, irrespective. And we actually need a little bit to keep us going. But actually, if it's too much, it overflows and we feel overwhelmed. But our tap works very well. So there's a really good section in the workbook looking at everybody's different, everybody's individual, but actually what opens your tap? What stops you from feeling stressed? Is it physical activity, running up and down the garden, bouncing on a trampoline, doing something different? Is it having a nice meal? Is it having a cuddle? Is it having a tickle? Tickling releases endorphins, which decreases your cortisol levels. So if you've got a really anxious child, giving them a really good tickle every now and again is very useful. And it's quite nice. And it's quite nice. But things like that can help. Um, we do a, when we look at moving our littlies up to, to primary school, we do a thing called pizza massage, which is about positive touch, and that uses, again, endorphins, and it's about telling a story while you are giving somebody a massage, and you talk about your pizza, and you put lots of ingredients in, and you do all sorts of different things, and you often use it as part of that going to bed routine, which just enables people to relax, and it releases your endorphins, and it helps your melatonin work when you're going off to sleep, and, and helps them sleep, because often when kids are anxious, they get anxious towards bedtime. So it's worth having a think. What is it that can open your tap, both as the big people, because if our, if our buckets are very full, we don't have a lot of tolerance with the little people, and also for the little people. Um, and then when it's feeling a bit overwhelming, think, actually, when was the last time we sat and had a cuddle? When was the last time we watched a really good film? When was the last time it all came together? How, how have we done all of this? Okay. Some of the other things that work, and I'm going to run through them with you, is a really good technique called three, four, five breathing. If you count to three, four, and five, you've got it sorted. We're going to have a go, which is a little bit difficult because I have to talk, count, and breathe all at the same time. Not that that could go wrong. So the aim with this is what you do is you physiologically slow your system down and enable you to slow it all down. So this is the opposite of the adrenaline sending it up is you slow it back down again. Um, so the aim is that you breathe in for three, you hold your breath for four, you blow out for five. Okay, we're going to give it a go together and see how that works. Okay, so I'm going to count one, two, three, and we'll breathe in. So breathe in, one, two, three, hold it, one, two, three, four, and blow out, one, two, three, four, five. And do it again, one, two, three, breathe in. One, two, three, four, hold it and blow out. One, two, three, four, five. Now this is a very subtle technique. You can do this standing in a queue, doing everything else, on your way into school, when you have a wobble. Nobody needs to know you're doing it, but actually it's a really nice way of using your physical elf to calm you down a little bit. So that works really well. One of the other things we talk about is self-esteem. Um, now, self-esteem is something that's often talked about, which is great. What do we actually mean by it? So here's my picture on self-esteem. So everybody has self-identity, and basically we're made up of two things. So we've got our physical traits, which says your eye colour, your hair colour, whether you're a boy, you're a girl, or you're tall, or you're short, all these sort of things, your physical traits, and your psychological traits, which are things you like and things you don't like. And, and self-esteem is the value that we give to these. 
So when you're looking at raising your children's self-esteem, and there's a whole load of ideas in the book about how to do it, it's about, do they know their physical traits? And that's why very early on in primary school, you do the, I'm drawing a picture, I'm a boy, I'm a girl, I'm a this tall, that tall, I've got this colour eyes and this colour hair and this, that and the other, because it helps them hang the hooks on, this is who I am physically, and then the psychological things is worth doing and worth spending the time with your kids. What meal is your favourite meal? What's your favourite TV programme? What's your favourite colour? What do you like? What do you not? And actually all that does is it helps them identify themselves as an individual. We're all different. It might be that in your house everybody likes scrambled egg apart from you. That's not a problem. But you need to know, do I like it? Do I not like it? What about this? What about that? And the more that our children are aware of these and we can give them the hooks, the easier they find it to be more confident in who they are. And part of that, when you hit puberty, is all of this changes. So your physical body does all sorts of weird and wonderful things. You hit hair and hormones and your brain capacity changes. And psychologically, what you like changes as well, which is why you, you generally get a dip in self-esteem around puberty when they're feeling more wobbly and everything else. So we talk about it a lot when we're doing our transition to secondary school because it's about saying, help your kids know what they like, who they are, and give them some really good positives. We live in a very funny world that has some strange ideas on what beautiful is. Actually, we're all individual and we're all very different. And our kids are really precious. So it's about saying to them, you've got a really good smile. You've got an absolute, you can tell really good jokes. You're really good at this, you're really good at that and actually giving some really nice positives. As part of our pack, we have in here some confidence stars. Whoops, she says dropping them. We have six of these, and the aim with this is that you put six really positive things about your child on these. So when they're having a wobble and going, <coughs> I'm no good at this, I can't do this, I hate maths, I don't understand this, I can't buy my shoes, the world's ended, which happens to all of us, you can say, no, go and have a look in your stars. I think all parents should have these on the backs of bedroom doors. So when parents are going, I can't parent, this is the hardest job in the world. They didn't give us a manual for this. You could go and look and go, no, actually, it's OK. I'm actually a nice human being and I can do it as well as everything else. So they're a fabulous um, reminder that actually we are all unique, we are all individual, but actually we've got some really cracking positive techniques and things that we can do. And when your kids are wobbling, it's really important that you push the real positives from there. And the, uh, so with raising self-esteem... Having conversations about your child's things. Model good self-esteem if you can. Really very important. If we're positive on who we are and how we fit, that makes a big deal for our kids. Uh, use your compliment stars, which are these ones. Try and catch your children doing something good. Now, that's a real challenge some days. <laughs> As parents, we are innately programmed to say, don't do this, don't do that, do this, do that, do the other, tidy up, do this, find your phone, work off your... And sometimes you do get to the end of the day and think, have I possibly said anything that didn't involve the word don't? <laughs> so your challenge tomorrow is to find something positive and say, well done for not biting your sibling. You can be as creative as you need to. Well done for the fact that it only took us seven times to get you into the car and not 57. Um, well done on this. Because actually, we all work better to positives than we do to negatives. And sometimes I think what happens is we get stuck in that, oh, come on, blah, 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 this is crazy, we're trying to get you out the door, we're trying to do this, that, and the other, <laughs> and we lose the positivity in that. And that's very hard, very easy then to get into different things. And allow your kids to grow and change. You know, this bit in primary school, they change, they, their brains to redevelop again and do all sorts of crazy things to puberty, and they change all over again. So just when you think you've got it sussed, they grow and they change. And they hit hormones, which is great fun. Now, mindset, growth mindset. This is fascinating. This was an experiment that was done quite a while ago, and it was done on two groups of children. So here are my two groups of children. And what Carol Dweck, Dweck did was she split them into two groups. So one group, she said, you are very intelligent. You're very intelligent, you're very intelligent. We think you're massively intelligent. You're really, really intelligent. We told these kids this for two weeks. 
The other set of children, they said to them for two weeks, you are really hard working. You're working really hard, you're working really hard, you're doing a really good job, you're working really hard. And then they gave them a choice and said, you can do a test. So you can do an easy test, or you can do a hard test. The choice is up to you. And what was absolutely fascinating and came out at every time was those who were praised for intelligence, two thirds of them did the easy test. Those that they praised for hard work, 90% did the harder test. Because what they found, and what they found consistently, was that work, effort, is a variable you can tr control. You know if you've done your homework. You know if your colouring or your art took you three and a half minutes because you hate it, or you sat there and you beautifully coloured it in. You know if you try. Intelligence is a variable that we feel is up here somewhere and we can't control. So if we tell our kids they're intelligent, they tend to stress that it's something they don't quite know how to achieve. And they repeated this test across multiple um, cultures, ethnic groups, all sorts of other things, and found exactly the same thing all the way through. In that if you want your children to feel more confident, praise them for effort and not for intelligence. Which is really interesting. So it's worth thinking about. So, we're now going to talk about our worries. <laughs> we've done everything. So we've got them, we do worry about stuff, and we're going to go through a three-step process about managing them. So what we're going to do is we're going to identify our thoughts, we're going to look at thoughts, feelings, and behaviour. We're going to identify them, we're going to challenge them, and we're going to come up with a plan to manage them. That's how we manage our wibbly-wobbly bits from there. Okay. So, how do we identify our worries? Now, it's not a good idea to shine lights in your kids' eyes. Works for the CIA for interrogation techniques. It's not ever so useful with children. What they found with a lot of the brain development stuff is if you want to get more information out of kids, do things side by side. Because they will talk to you and chat to you and do things from there. So, it is really important that you allow them the space to be able to do it, go for a walk, do something different, kick a football back and forward to each other, throw a ball, do something that enables them not to feel like you're monitoring what they're saying and join in. Okay, so identifying that we're wanting you to, be, to try and work it out. In your pack, you have a worry book. So you can write down your worries. This is this, this is that, this is the other. We also have a worry jar. This is very cool if you're a very tactile person and you like writing on things and then wiping them off, you can write your worries on, and then when we deal with them, you can wipe them off. Quite good fun, that. Gets a little bit messy occasionally. Um, but the idea is, is capture those worries. What you've got is you've got negative thoughts buzzing around your head and you want to capture them in again. So the aim is to be as specific as possible. So how do we work out how we're feeling? Because that can be quite hard. In your pack, you have a how do you feel today chart. Ta-da! They're very fun faces. And what this does is it helps children try and work out how they're feeling, what's going on, and what's happening. Um, emotions are very much like words. So when your children were tiny and you were teaching them words, you repeated that word about 433 times, usually per minute. So it started things like, here's a cup, would you like a cup? What do you want in your cup? And then eventually your child says cup, and you go, they're a genius! <sighs> and everybody's fed up with the word cup. Emotions are very similar in that we have to teach our children the hooks to hang them on. Some of them are dead easy. We get happy, we get sad. Some of the other feelings are a little bit more complicated. Um, and this is the um, lower stage one, and we've got a bigger complicated map that looks at all sorts of things like being grumpy and miserable and avoidant and all the things that slightly bigger children are at. But the aim is, if you can help your child work out how they're feeling, it helps them identify it. And if they can verbalise, I'm confused. I was really proud today because I did something really good. It can be really useful. Now, these you can use in lots of different ways. One of the games you can do, have it at the tea table, get everybody to go around and name an emotion that they've had today. Can be very good and it helps them understand different feelings. And actually, the adults have big feelings. And actually, you can get quite angry if you get stuck in traffic or the train doesn't work or somebody's miserable at work, or whatever it is. But actually, what you can do by talking about it is enable your children to manage it better. And actually, negative emotions aren't a problem because they're part of what they are. It's putting them in a story 
and understanding them is the bit that helps. So how you're feeling are quite good. The other thing that's hard to do, because English language is a very funny language, is how big is that feeling? So sometimes you can be happy, are you a little bit happy or a big bit happy? And does that make it delight or pride or excitement or what? We have too many words. So sometimes what you need to do is make it not too complicated. And we have our ladder. And the idea with this is it gives us an idea of 1 to 10 on how big a feeling it is. Numbers are great. Scales are wonderful. You can use them for everything. How hungry are you on a 1 to 10? Not too hungry. Going to eat my sibling at 10. Um, you know, how bored are you? That's quite a good one on 1 to 10 in school. Can be quite intriguing. Um, because often what we do is we use the same word to mean a big range of feelings. And what we want to do is we want to enable them to think, how wobbly or anxious am I feeling? And is this a very big feeling as a 10? Or is this a not too bad feeling at a 4? And actually, give me a hug and I'll be fine and I can carry on. Or do I need some help working out what to do when it's really big? So the, the Wibbles and Wobbles ladder is really useful to work out how big is that feeling. The other thing to do about identifying worries is to be quite strict. When we give you all these techniques, it's very easy to go away and psychoanalyse your children for large periods of time. I don't recommend it. Um, but what you need to do is just say, right, we are only going to look at worries at a specific time. Because they can become overwhelming. If you can write them down, we'll deal with it later. So one of the best options I've found with littlies and, and worries is don't do it at bedtime. Because by that time you're tired and you're weary. And to be fair, as big people, we generally want them to go to bed. So we tend to be not quite so patient when the whole, come on, I'd like to go and have be a grown-up on my own. Um, and actually what happens if you talk about lots of worries just before you go to bed, they whiz around your head as you're trying to go off to sleep and that doesn't help and your cortisol levels go up. So what can work quite nicely is make sure they're fed, make sure they're not too tired. So after tea, do a little bit of right. This is when we're going to look through our worries. What's on our list? What's on our worry list? What are we concerned about? And let's work out what we're going to do with them. We have 20 minutes. We have half an hour. We don't discuss this for the next four and a half years. We don't discuss it till midnight. It's not going to help. We are going to do it in a very short time. We're going to work out what we're doing and we're going to move on from there. And then go and do something completely different. So have tea, worry time, something different. Preferably something that's interesting, fun, involves physical exercise. Go and run up and down the garden 15 times or not in the rain, but you know. Do something that's different before you go to bed because then it enables it not to feel like it's overwhelming. Because sometimes what happens when you've got children that are feeling anxious is you spend a lot of time going, how are you doing? It's all right. Um, so have your worry time and use your worry list. They're really good at defining it. So if you've got things whizzing around your head, write it down, we'll come back to that. And if you know you've got an allocated time, it doesn't feel so big. It doesn't feel that this negative arrow is stopping you thinking. You can think, yep, yeah, I'll come back to that, and it's all okay. So... We now have these, we've now got to work out what to do with them. I don't know how many of you have come across this book, The Huge Bag of Worries. Really lovely book, really nicely written. And it talks about a little girl called Judy who has some worries. And what happens is that these worries get bigger and bigger and bigger and she feels like she's got a big bag of them. And they're enormous and they're scary. And she tries all sorts of things. She shoves them in a cupboard, she hides them, but she can't get away from them. And she doesn't know what to do. And what happens in the end is she sits on a step feeling very sad for her. And a very nice old lady, because lately old ladies are very good at things, um, comes along and says, do you know what we need to do? We need to have a look at these worries. We need to open this bag and see what's in it. Because actually I think some of them are a little bit too big. And you're thinking they're bigger than what they are. So what they do is they take them all out and they line them all up. Which is great. And sometimes that's exactly the same technique as writing them down. Let's look at what we're worrying about. Because sometimes we get very good at worrying that we can worry about worrying. And we can worry about the feeling that we might be worried. And because we get labelled a worrier. So what you need to do is work out from these, which worries do we worry about? So, is it a real concern? And when you line up your worries, we can work out, is it big? Is it needing sorting? Or do we not? And things that are n things we can't control, we can work out. And this is a, quite an interesting thing to do, is to work out with your children which bits are they worrying about. Are they worrying about things that are theirs? 
Are they worrying about other people's worries? Children have the great ability to listen to a lot of what you say, even though they appear to pay no attention. So it might be they've picked up on half a conversation, added a whole load in between, and have now decided that the world's going to end. And they've been worrying about that because they've picked up on something. So sometimes defining what you're worrying about actually helps because sometimes it's putting that framework around it that says, no, I said that we may move house when you're 47, not that we're moving next week and we're not taking you with us. But half a conversation here and there, you get different things. Um, so the other technique that you can use is one called take a thought to court. Now this is in your book. And the idea with this is that what you do is you've got a pen in your pack, you divide your page up and you look at what's the worrying thought. So it could be, I've got no friends. Nobody likes me. Everybody hates me. And it's awful. So things that your kids, and you think, okay, well, that, that seems quite a worry. Let's try and work out. Do I need to march you down to school and insist that everybody plays with you? Do I need to tell you that this is part of normal life? Or do I do something in between? Because where does it come from? So what you do is you then think, right, let's work out. And it's always good to start with the evidence against it. So when you get the, I've got no friends, nobody likes me bit, it's worth going through the evidence against. Okay, who did you play with today? Who did you play with at lunchtime? Who did you do that with? Has anybody invited you to a birthday party? When you went to Brownie Scouts, this, that, and the other boys brigade, whatever, did people talk to you? When you went to football club, was it fun? Did you do this, that, and the other? And you can usually find quite a long list of evidence for. When you come to the evidence, uh, evidence against me, when you come to the, hmm, where did this come from? Often what tends to happen is you unpick it and it's a comment. Somebody said, you're not my friend. I don't like you and I'm not going to play with you ever again. Um, and that's where it's all come from. And this is where people then worry about. And sometimes it's, it's then able to say, just because they said it once when they were cross doesn't mean they mean it. And they said that last week and they're still your friend. And it's about helping kids then work through Actually, when you weigh it all up, lots of people like you, and it's actually not too bad, so it isn't something to massively worry about. Okay, so the take a thought to court is really useful. You can use it on lots of things, and you can do it as a written exercise, you can do it as a discussion as you're walking down the road, you can do it in the car, best not to take your hands off the driving when you're driving. But the whole idea of, hmm, why do you think that? Do we think there's lots of evidence for that? And the aim is that it's exactly the same as going to court, which hopefully you don't do at this age. Um, and they weigh up the evidence and say, which is the most? Is it for or is it against? And generally when you break it down, it often is. So you get things like, I'm rubbish at maths. I can't do maths, I hate maths. Which when you break it down, you've been doing ever so well in your maths things. You've, done ever so, you've got smiley faces, you've got ticks, you've got this, that and the other. But actually what happened was... I don't get this bit. I don't understand this new piece of homework that they've given to me, and that's where I'm now going, boom, and doing things from there. So it's unpicking and working and challenging it. And sometimes what you find when you do the challenging bits with your kids is you will find stuff out. You may find that they are being bullied. You may find that they're being hassled. You may find that somebody's actually not being very nice. And actually, if you do find that, that's the bit where, as the big person, you need to go and do something. You need to make their lives as safe and as sensible as we can by going and talking to school, by having that conversation, by raising those issues and saying, actually, part of the root problem here is this, and this relationship isn't working, or this is becoming a problem. Can you help us do it? Okay. So, we've had a look, we've worked it out. The other thing that's quite useful when we're looking at other people's worries is write them down and then throw them away. If you've got very pictorial kids, aeroplanes are quite good, you know. Mummy's worries about, I don't know, what do mummies worry about? Weight, <laughs> Christmas, um, cooking, trying to get too many things in, all those things that, and you just say, well, they're a mummy worry. So give that to mummy. You don't need to worry about mummy worries. You don't need to worry about granny worries. You don't need to worry about daddy worries. You don't need to worry about the next door neighbor's worries. You don't need to worry about the whole world's worries because that's why we get big people to have jobs like Prime Ministers, which you really wouldn't want to have jobs like at the moment. Um, but some of it is actually making those aeroplanes and doing them away. The other thing to bear in mind when you're challenging the thoughts is sometimes what's happened is current events spark concerns. So 
there, you know, when all the stuff kicked off in London and there was um, the driving into people on the, on the bridge, that caused quite a lot of anxiety for an awful lot of children. Um, and that's real fear. You know, something's happened, they've seen it, they then worry. If my so-and-so has to go to, to that place, does it mean that everybody who goes there does that? And sometimes what you need to do in that challenging thoughts is say, there were this many people there, and it happens to this many people. And, you know, lots of people do this, but it doesn't happen. And if somebody did, what could we do? And actually coming up with a plan, if you've got a child that needs to know, and needs to know what to do, if somebody, you know, if we lose the cat, what will we do? Well, we will ring the vets, we will put posters up, we will talk to the neighbours, we will do a check round, and we've got a plan. So then they don't have to worry that it's going to be unmanageable because there's a plan. And again, you know your kids. Is making a plan useful and enables them to put that worry down, or is it just exacerbating it? So it's trying to work that balance on what you do. So when you get to a plan, and we've worked out what it is, what it feels like, how big it is, is it a real worry? We now need to do something about it. We need to break it down and come up with an option. So with that, we've, as I said, we've identified it, challenged it, and decided we need a plan. So what you've got here is you've got our mental elves ladder to success. And the thing with this is, it's very hard if you're wobbling to go from being wobbly to being absolutely fine, like that. You can have a conversation, but it's still quite hard because our physiology doesn't want to do it, our head says it's not a good idea. So we need to take children through a series of steps. The example I give of this um, is a little boy called Jamie who had got into his head that he couldn't be upstairs because there was a monster up there that would eat him. There wasn't a monster, I'd like to point that out before I freak everybody else out about going upstairs. Now, there wasn't, he'd watched a cartoon and had got the wrong idea and thought that that monster was going to eat him. So he did not want to go upstairs. So no matter how many times his mum said, it's fine, it's fine, he didn't want to go upstairs. So what you do is we broke it down. So we said step one, right, if we make it simple, what you need to do for step one is run to the top of the stairs, count to ten, run back down. I was like, is that it? It's like, yep. So ran to the top of the stairs, stood there, counted to ten, came back down again. Excellent. And he's like, okay, it's using a process called what's called desensitisation. So it's about enabling those steps to happen without anything horrible happening. And the more times you do it, the more times you realise it's okay. And you can move further and quicker through the process. So did that. That was great. Second step, go to the top of the stairs, sit at the top of the stairs for five minutes, read a book. Started off with these initial steps with mum being at the bottom of the steps. Because he needed to visually see it. As you move up the steps, mum minded out the way. What you found is that they often do steps one, two, and three really, really well. Everybody's cooking on gas, this is looking good. And then you have a wobble and go back a bit. That is perfectly normal. That is not the bit to go, oh, it doesn't work. Oh no, the end of the world's good. Um, what you need to do is go, well, let's go back and do step two. If step two is just read a book and you're not ready to be upstairs on your own for a bit longer, we'll just go back to that stage. And we'll do that again for a couple of days. Lots of positive encouragement, lots of things, lots of using your stars, lots of saying you're getting this sorted, lots of saying it's a ladder. You don't climb a ladder in one step, you climb a ladder in steps. Um, next step was have a friend round to play, play upstairs with a friend. Did absolutely fine. Next step was I could play upstairs on my own with a timer for 30 minutes. Did that. Next step after that, absolutely fine. But you have to break it down to enable them to do it. And sometimes when our kids get a little bit stuck with their wobbles, it's about breaking it down. So instead of saying, oh, no, it's fine, you can actually enable them to go, okay. And actually the best way to do it is to work with them. If we are wanting to achieve a goal at the top here, what is our goal and how are we going to get there? They will be a lot more, they'll have a lot of ideas on how they can do it. Once you get the whole idea that your mental health is going to help you and you're going to do it and we're going to do this. And you can give. It's about finding your child's currency of bribery. Do they like a sticker? Do they like a clap? Do they like a penny in a jar? What inspires them to feel good that they're getting somewhere? And that's why in primary school they use lots of group things with kids and putting marbles in jars and doing bits and pieces and everything else. So lots of choice. Work your way up. At times you're going to slip back a bit. Work your way. Lots of positives, lots of encouragement and things from there, and come up with a plan that will work. <coughs> okay.
so that, as I said, what you're going to try and achieve, where you are now, and what steps you do, and that's Yelanda. And it works for all sorts of different things, because it allows it to be broken down, it allows it to be achievable, um, and work through from there. Okay, the other thing that you can also use is you can use your senses at the same time. We're quite interesting human beings in that we can smell, we can see, we can hear things. Now, this is our cuddle stone. These are fabulous. These we get from Kenya. We've got some friends in Kenya. These are fair trade from Kenya. These are sandstones that come in amazing colours. And the idea with this is it uses a concept called holding in mind. So what you do as the big person, you put lots of love, cuddles, nice things, positive thoughts into the stone. And you give it to your little person and you say, when you're feeling wobbly, if I'm not there, you can rub your stone and it feels like you're having a hug. You know that I'm thinking about you and I'm with you. These are very subtle. They've got nothing written on them. They come in a fabulous range of colours. You can pop them in your pocket for school. And if anybody finds them, they don't know what they are. But it enables you to, to feel loved, supported and that somebody's thinking about you. They are cracking. We sell loads of these to all range of ages. I did a talk at a businessman's meeting not so long ago and sold a load there. <laughs> Which I think they all said it was for grandchildren, but I'm not convinced. Uh, they are really good. They are really positive. The other things are is sometimes the children are very, um, if they prefer smell, putting some perfume on a handkerchief so that if they're away from you and they're wobbling and they can smell your perfume just enables them to feel a bit calmer and a bit more relaxed. So there's lots of different ways you can use together to make things work. So what doesn't help? I always think this is worth doing first because actually it's really hard as a parent. As I said, you have a child, you can leave the hospital within two hours. They don't come with instructions. You buy IKEA furniture and it comes with instructions. Children don't. And it's a scary old business. So don't, this is not a guilt trip. This is not an option for you to sit there and think, I've broken my child. This is saying with the information you now know, try not to do the following. Okay? Try not to allow them to avoid. Because what happens is they take their cues from you. Okay, they see the world through the eyes of the age that they are, you see the world through the eyes of the age you are and your experiences. And they take their feedback from you. So, if I am quite little and I don't want to do something and I get into my head and think I want to avoid it and I say to, say Margaret is my big person and I say to Margaret, I don't want to do that! And she says, then in my head I say, think, oh, it must be worse than what I thought it was. They must really be bears in Banbury because she said I didn't have to go and that I don't need to do this and this is real. So it actually it compounds things and it makes it worse. <clears throat> so what you need to do is try, if you can, to stop the avoidance because otherwise they read into it and think, yeah, there's more to this. There's things they're not telling me from there. The other thing that's very easy to do is say, I'll be fine, I'll be fine, I'll be fine, I'll be fine. And for some things, their children need a nudge. For some things, they need to work through those feelings. They need to identify what they are, how big they are, are they real, what they're going to do with them and come up with a plan. Dismissing saying you really shouldn't worry is not actually that useful. Very easy to do, and we've all done it. Um, you've got people looking at people all over the place here now. Um, because it is easy to do. The problem is, is if we do it all the time, we don't allow our children to actually explain and work through and manage those feelings. Um, and that's what it is. It's feelings that get very big that we need to work through. And very often with, with child mental health, what we say is to get a hold of feelings, you put them within a story and you make sense of why that feels like that and then they don't feel so big and overwhelming. Um, comparing and labelling, it's very easy if you have more than one child or have ever met more than one child to go, well, so-and-so doesn't do that. Your sister can put her own shoes on and you can't. Oh, or you could do this. Oh, why can't you understand maths? And what about that? And it's the easiest thing in the world to do, but actually it's really not helpful. We are all unique. We are all individuals and we all have great characteristics. So comparing doesn't always help. And also, there's a whole load around um, family um, themes and what you get used to. And often within families, everybody falls into different roles which is why when you bring families together at Christmas, even when they're grown up, they all revert back to their original childish roles and things get quite interesting. Um, so be careful about labelling your children. The cheeky one, the funny one, the naughty one, the, you know, the sporty one, the uncoordinated one, the everything else one. Because these labels stick 
and then people think that they are part of that label. We all have characteristics we're good at. I was supposed to be the uncoordinated one in my family, which did stick for quite a long time, actually. Um, but there we go. Um, but again, think about what you label, what you say, uh, because words are extremely powerful. And also as adults, what are we modelling? Are we anxious? Do we worry about things? Are we somebody who feels that we get lots of wonky doorbells and they feel overwhelming? Because our kids pick up on that. You know, the techniques we use here are exactly the same as what adults use. Um, so you can use them yourselves. And those are fantastic opportunities to get help if you need support um, for managing anxiety. So if, if an anxiety is something that you as a grown-up suffer with, actually modelling to your children, I got stuck with this, I went and got help with this, this made a big difference to me, enables us to stop some of the myths around mental health, which is we can't talk about it, we can't handle it, we can't manage it. So it's, it's something to consider. So what does help? We might as well but at least be positive, <laughs> having told you what not to do. So, raising your self-esteem. There's some really good evidence that kids with high self-esteem don't get bullied and don't <coughs> join gangs. Not sure the gang culture is terribly prevalent at four and five in Banbury and Bloxham, but actually it's about that wanting to belong. So the, the stars are fantastic and building confidence is really good. And the other thing is, is come alongside and help them. You taught them letters, you taught them words, you taught them to tie their shoelaces, you hopefully are going to grow a, a normal human being out the other side. Managing emotions is exactly the same. It's about teaching them to do it and enabling them to learn and help to manage them. So see it as a skill. Teach your child a skill. You know, we don't expect our kids to be able to cycle their bikes or tie their shoelaces straight away, but we do expect them to manage their emotions really easily, which seems a bit crackers really. So see it as a, t as a skill that you can teach your child how to name their feelings, how to work out how big they are, how to fit them within a story. You know, as adults, if we can articulate, I'm very frustrated because my computer's on the blink. It doesn't stop your computer being on the blink, but it helps it feel that the feeling is less overwhelming. So it's about enabling things from there. Try to empower your child and not rescue. It's very easy to just rescue your child when they're wobbling and when they're doing things. And again, it's about getting that balance. Our brains are very interesting things. We have a base brain, we have what's called a limbic brain, which is the bit you're born with, that's your fight and flight. And then you have your cognitive bit, which you grow at the top. The top part of your brain is your thinking and logical brain. This is the bit you want your children to be functioning in. What happens is, is when the feelings get too big and too overwhelming, we effectively flip our lid and what happens is we revert to our limbic brain. Which is why if you ever try and have a conversation with a child when they've completely lost the plot, it's a total and utter waste of time. So what you need to do at that point is scoop them up, contain them, help them to calm down, do some breathing, get their functioning brain back in and working, and enable them from there. Okay? But if they're still at their thinking brain, don't keep rescuing them the whole time. You know, don't send them out to get a job at, at 12, you know a bit much but actually working out feelings working out frustrations working out that I don't like this and I'm good at that and everything else is a whole really useful skill to do okay distraction marvelous all else fails there's bird there's blade there's this there's that works really well on toddlers actually works well on most kids <laughs> and adults to be fair mother-in-laws as well um you know Distraction can be quite useful because sometimes what happens is we get very sucked in to, oh, okay, let's work out what the issue is. This is where the book's a good idea. Write it down, have a time, and then do something nice, do something fun. If anxiety is something and the big feelings, it's part of life. You've got, you can keep functioning with anxiety quite helpfully if you use the right skills. Um, so, yeah, use your worry time, get on with life, do stuff, and take it from there. And keep going. It's not going to change overnight. Um, this is a process and a learning thing. As I said, you don't learn to tie your shoelaces in 10 minutes. You don't learn to ride a bike. One of my children got so frustrated in learning to ride a bike, she bit it. <laughs> we still tease her now. Um, because it was very cross and the bike wouldn't work. Um, but it takes a while to learn. What we know from brain development is it takes up to nearly 25 to 28 to grow a full adult functioning brain. So we need to give our kids a little bit of grace that they are not going to get it. 
that they don't understand big feelings, that they're going to feel overwhelmed, that they're going to want to throw themselves on the floor and not be things. To be fair, quite a lot of adults would like to throw themselves on the floor and throw tantrums occasionally. It would be quite therapeutic. <laughs> uh, possibly not the best way of going forward with things. But again, keep going and keep checking things. So when do you need more help? We've gone through the very basics. We've looked at what anxiety is. We've looked at different techniques that work, and they do work. Um, but what if you need more? When do you need more and when do you get more help? Um, so when this anxiety is becoming inhibitory on life and when things are feeling like they're not moving on, when you've tried to break it down, when you've tried to come up with a plan but you're getting really stuck, that's when it becomes a problem. When you've been trying properly using these techniques for, a, for three months, it's, it feels like a long time. You, it, to change your brain um, things, it takes two to three weeks to change it and six weeks to make a habit. So it takes a while because your brain connections have to change and you have to work out how to do it. So when you've been doing it and you're not seeing a response, you're using the <coughs> and you're working through things. Um, and what can you do? What are your options? You can contact us. Um, at the moment, we are at our first stage where we're doing lots of talks and I'm doing one day a week with um, standing in the gap. We are hoping to expand. We are looking at bigger funding. Our aim is we want to have an office in Banbury where people can drop in and we can do one-to-one -one support on a whole range of emotions. So you can contact us, you can contact us by the website and we'll do what we can do, depending on where we're at in that thing. The other people you can talk to, you can go to your GP. Your GP is responsible for all of your healthcare, um, physical and emotional, and they can be very supportive. A lot of GPs are now sending people to these talks, which is great, um, but it's looking at the different options that are available. And if things don't work, you can go back to your GP and go up to the next level level. In child mental health things are done in tiers. We work in tiers one and two. Tier three is CAMS, tier four is inpatient. So it's about different levels that people need. You can ask for support from school. Um, schools are often very good with SENCOs and different bits and can support around different things um, from there. Um, and you can ask for a referral to CAMS for tier three service if you require it. Um, the thing is, what we find with a lot of things is anxiety goes with lots of things. 50% of adult mental, mental health diagnoses are made by the age of 14. Um, so you can end up with quite significant long-term problems that are going to need more support, but you've got to work them through. So you have to try the basic bits first to see where they do, and if they don't work, it doesn't mean you're not doing the techniques properly. It might mean you need more support. So don't go away and think, I tried it, it didn't work that woman she's rubbish <laughs> please come back and we'll work out what the next bit is okay I always say it's a bit like headaches if you have a headache you do the normal have a drank enough et enough done enough taken a paracetamol done this that and the other you don't immediately think I have a brain tumor and I should go straight to a and &E. you may do but you tend to work through the stages first the problem is when we talk about emotions we tend to be extreme and worry about things Okay, if you found this useful, and I hope you have, um, please do consider if you can make a donation to us. We run all of our talks for free for a reason. We want to make them accessible to everybody. Um, we are just looking, we've got one more talk in November, um, which is pretty full, and I'm looking at all the venues for next year. So our aim is that we will continue to run an anxiety talk once a month through the whole of 2020. So if you've got other people that are interested um, who would find it useful, please do recommend us. Um, but if you can make a donation, that's fabulous. We can do it by cash or card. So as long as the wind's blowing in the right direction, the cards do work. Um, we have anxiety packs. Do consider using them. The workbook and all the extras are really useful. Um, please, in your packs, you have got an evaluation. Please fill that in. It's really, really helpful. Um, and there's a bit at the bottom to sign up for our newsletter. If you want to know what we're up to and how we're changing, please do sign up for that. You can consider whether you support us regularly. We're in the process of changing our website and looking at setting up regular donations, the price of a cup of coffee a month can really help us as a charity. Um, if you use the internet and shop on it, there's a really good thing called Give As You Live. You can sign up via them and 4,200 shops give us a percentage of what you buy. So all sorts, Sainsbury's, Tesco's, Asda, John Lewis, eBay, all sorts of different things. You don't pay any more. Their social responsibility is they make a percentage of donation to us, which is fantastic. So they're really good. And we recycle ink cartridges because we do our bit for the environment. So in your packs, you should have an um, envelope if you've got any ink cartridges. If you work anywhere 
or your schools are interested at doing ink boxes, we do big boxes that people can then fill them up, let us know when they're full, we'll collect them and give you a new box. So a couple of the churches in the area have all got boxes in them where we collect lots of ink cartridges.